paying close attention to managing a fully invested portfolio by selecting which companies are removed and to be replaced by better performing companies into what looks to be a strong run towards Christmas. The portfolio is doing well and Gary Glover is the one running it. We're joined by him this morning. Good morning, Gary. How are you? I'm good, Chris. Yeah, you're, um, we've actually nailed that intro there because it um, wasn't what I was thinking, but you're, yeah, you're, you're right. You wish we need to be as traders here or as investors, we need to be, you know, looking through our positions and probably getting rid of the weakest and either adding to the strongest or, or looking for the new strongest. So we either we can we can get rid of the ones that aren't, aren't performing, um, add to the ones that are, or we can try and find some new ones that are going to perform better. So yeah, that's a good analysis. Well, uh, if we have a look at your portfolio, it's done exceptionally well. Now, last week you covered, uh, you said that you were comfortable with your portfolio because you're sleeping well knowing that if the market was to drop out, you've only got about 1% at risk and I think it was around about 20% possible upside. So that's because you're managing these stops. Is there maybe a, a share on that list there on the screen in the portfolio that you could say, look, you started with a stop at X and you've now moved it up to give us a bit of an example of how you've moved a stop or how the stop gets to break even? Yeah, that's probably more so PA actually. That's sort of, um, as I'm sort of, I, I'm, I manage mine a little tighter than, than the model portfolio, but I will sort of, um, yeah, well, model portfolio, I do sort of try and edge them up there. Probably just model portfolio, I'm probably a bit more wider, um, try and give myself a bit more room. So I might might operate with a, you know, five to 7% stop, sometimes a little wider there if I need to. Um, but um but yeah, I'll just sort of try and review those sort of each week and, and edge them up a little bit there. Um, but I think more importantly there is what sort of you know, with that, we can see there with the NASDAQ there, the NASDAQ is sort of underperforming and that's sort of, you know, I've, I've got a, you know, um, I've got a, 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 a long NAS position instead of a G, G Gus. I think I mentioned there probably the, the G Gus. You know, for, for clients who have bought some of the L NAS and the G Gus, but the G Gus is performing really well, but the um, but the L NAS is not performing as well. It's sort of lagging here. So everything else is looking pretty good. Just uh, that, yeah, that Nasdaq is underperforming. Then that's probably a result of we've had a pretty high inflation rate here, and we look at some of those historical. Um, you yeah, know, well, we had a few charts in the past there about the seventies and which which sectors perform best. Perform best. We know that the, the Nasdaq, the growth, doesn't perform so well in high inflationary environments. So, until inflation starts to subside, potentially tech's going to lag a little bit here. So, still think the Nasdaq can go higher, but it's not going to be the not, doesn't. It's not showing relative strength compared to the other indices. Obviously, the Dow is really strong there. So that's sort of so it is sort of already the market's already it's starting to shape up. Yeah, similar to a high inflationary environment. Obviously, we've seen energy pretty robust and some of the value shares have already sort of moved, the ones that are sort of um, paying you know, reasonable dividends. And so they're, they're showing a bit of strength as well. So just means it probably just needs to pivot a little bit there. So um, I think if we see a little bit of a bounce in the NASDAQ here, um, I'd probably just exit some of my long NAS and then just redirect it somewhere else where I think it's going to be better performing. So I'm happy with most of the other things I've got there. That's that's definitely my laggard in the portfolio, the one that's not performing. So there's that sort of duty to sort of go through and review and take out the the weakest. And there's a reason why that man that might might change. Now I think in 2002, 2003, the Nasdaq had a bit of a weak bounce off the low initially, and then it came back and I think made a high low and in March 03, and then after that was sort of when the Nasdaq took off there. So it's, yeah, that was probably five months from the low that it took to sort of build and get going. So, you know, we, we don't really want to, I don't want to be sitting in something for five months, which is going to underperform. So time to review that and move it on. So um, whereas we can see with the S&P showing a bit more strength, um, has bounced a bit further up here. Although we've had that bit of a you know, down week last week, that's nothing, nothing, nothing too abnormal there. So I still think it looks, looks quite good there. Market's a little, yeah, it's a little bit up and down here. Sometimes you can see explosive moves out of this October lows here. So this is a bit more of a grind than some of the other years. But um, but yeah, I still think we'll move high here. Just 
just might be a little bit like 2002, 2003. They might just sort of come back up under the range, might come back and do a deep retest into, into February. So maybe doing it, and, and that might be our first higher low back in February. So you, know, you might sort of come back to that left shoulder there. Once that, where's that sort of around um, 3.7 or something there? So maybe maybe we go up to 4.2, maybe even 4.2, yeah, 50. We might surprise some. Come back down and make a right shoulder here, somewhere around three seven. Big inverse head and shoulder potentially pattern there. I think that's sort of similar to two thousand two thousand three. Um, yeah, but yeah, it's just it's you know it's not, not being it's been positive here so far, but it's not being explosive like some of the midterm years are. So just going to be a little more tempted there with that with that view. Probably just get a safe you know look for the stocks that are holding up the best. You know, trade those you know good quality industrial sort of more value sort of shares there. So. Just got to do a little tweaking, but it's okay. Well, the Australian market, you have said for some time, uh, we're more value and we do have the benefit of the Australian banks and their dividends. Would you be looking for us to come back to a similar sort of back to that recent high that we had sort of mid-August? Would that be where the Aussie might be going to? Yeah, probably finding the Aussie market a little harder to read, actually, just because we've got conflicting cycles here at the moment. So... The, the inflationary cycle usually means that commodities are um, reasonably buoyant, um, whereas the normal sort of um, growth crunch sort of cycle, the normal equities cycle, would suggest that, um, that commodities tend to lag and find the low last. So it feels like bonds have found a low here and sort of equities have gone through the low here. We just, commodities are still sort of lagging here. So we've seen some weakness in the commodities, but we just, they have been super volatile. There's sort of definitely a um, bit of an arm wrestle there with commodities. We're sort of, we've still got sort of lots of lower highs and, and still moving down, but some of the bounces are pretty, pretty big as well. So, I mean, I know they do trade around. I mean, if you look at sort of um, commodities, and you know, I remember previous years covering BHP and Rio, sometimes you can get, you know, they can bounce back three quarters into the range before they head back down again and then bounce three quarters back in the range again. So they they do have these channels and big deep retracements there. So so just interesting there. We sort of got it's a bit of an arm wrestle there as to but the normal normal equity cycle where commodities are last to find a low versus sort of this high inflationary environment where commodities can um, can hang around and can be elevated. So um, yeah I'm sort of avoiding that just because I sort of not clear which one's going to which one's going to win out there. So finding that too hard, pretty volatile as well. Big up and down moves there. So the only one that interests me here at the moment is sort of some of the gold stock here at the moment. Um, does does sort of feel like gold sort of trying to build here? Sort of still been a little disappointing, but um, yes, yeah, some some early signs is you know some bit of strength coming in some of the golds here. It's actually holding up here. So um, that's the one that I'm probably most interested in at the moment. Well, that's a, a good read on the commodities because they are definitely volatile. We're seeing in the Friday reports, we're looking at it and we're getting some leaders within the group where they're really on high momentum and they're running hard, but others within the group are being left behind. So we're seeing a real divergence as opposed to the last two years where the commodities yeah. were just all running. Uh, yes, if, yeah, yeah. So. that's right. No, like normally iron ore, the whole sector will be, will be on fire or lithium, the whole sector will be on fire. But at the moment, you're seeing, yeah, you're 100% correct there, Chris. You're saying some of them are still holding on pretty well and others have started to sell off really aggressively. So it's like, well, what am I, you know, it's definitely I sort of, you know, and I've got this, 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 this oftentimes when the cycles all line up and it'll say exactly the same thing, then you can trade that with confidence. But at the moment, we've got two cycles that are opposing each other, saying different things and the, and the, and the, and the stocks are doing different things. So it's, it's not making it a clear scenario so to me that's just an avoid I, you know why trade something which is too hard so we will go and go and find the easier things to to trade and stick with those so yeah there are some easier trades out there at the moment so we'll just focus on those that's a, a good point why trade something if it's too hard yeah. well so maybe we'll leave it put a question out to some of the viewers there because I've noted some divergence within the commodities the smaller uh, mining companies the battery minerals and there's been a thesis put forward that those that are exposed geographically to the US and closer to them 
have been outperforming those who are not. So if anyone's following that, we'd be interested in their thoughts. But yeah, uh, yeah that'd be someone's dissected that sector. Um, but you've done, you've taken us uh, back north with the Chinese market. You've done it a few times before, and credit where credit's due, because I know you're not going to do this for yourself. You did talk about the accelerating cycle, the three accelerating trend lines in the Shanghai before the blow off top. And that did transpire in the US markets, which helped you position yourself to be short. So we've looked at this Shanghai a few times before, but it's a different reason you've put it in the report this week. So what's it doing now? And why is that of interest? Yes, it's funny. Those, you know, those equity markets got vertical here. So, I mean, those sort of charts there are sort of, I mean, the NASDAQ did sort of something similar, but not as crazy. Um, but, you know, you got some commodities like, you know, coal at the moment, coal stocks, I look like that. Um, and everyone's got their goggles on at the moment as to what they're sort of seeing in front of them. Um, the problem with vertical charts is they all end the same way. <laughs> so you can't sort of see, you know, forest from the trees, you know, it's just sort of, it's, yeah, you just got to be careful with those sort of vertical markets here. We just, you know, I know there's, you know, great reasons to be long energy and stuff here, but some of those sort of um, instruments there, some of the stocks are vertical through the roof here. So um, history just tells us you've got to be cautious there when everyone else has got the blinkers on. Um, but, I mean, it, it's interesting. Chinese market has come back down to retest this sort of bottom of the range here. So we've had a few touches here now. We've sort of had that, you know, one, two, three, four touches there, all been pretty, um, you know, some validity off, off the last couple. Uh, that, that one in 18 now managed to sort of trade that. Um, but we've sort of come back down here again to the bottom of the range here and we're sort of, it's interesting, you're just sort of starting to sort of see, you know, there was a bit of bit of a panic sell off there last week and some of those um, equities, some obviously, you know, normally when you're sort of near a low there, you see that little bit of a capitulation there. So just interesting sort of seeing a bit of the panic with some of those equities. And now we're sort of talking about maybe China coming out of the COVID era there, you know, so it's all, you know, talky. There was, there was an article this morning actually I saw from uh, someone sent me from, might have been Goldman Sachs saying that if, you know, if, if China do um, alter this sort of stance on COVID, Chinese equities could bounce 20% was what Goldman Sachs was saying. So, um, yeah, there's, I think it's a bit early that I don't, I don't think, look, oh, they said they weren't going to change. So we, it would you know, be quite a big turnaround if they do change here. But um, all I know is that the equities here have sort of definitely um, capitulated into a bit of a low and starting to see a little bit of um, signs of upside here. And we just we technically we've sort of come back to a big zone there. So there's definitely a couple of ETFs there. I think the, the C new and I think the C ETF are the couple of Chinese, a couple of the Van Eck sort of um, China funds that I've traded in the past. Yeah. Quite like Benek, they're actually quite good funds. Um, so there's sort of something to have a look at there. Um, but yeah, I'll be having a look at those here in the next week or two here. I just still feels a tiny bit early here, but um, yeah, we've got the makings of probably you know, a decent bounce here as well. Let's say uh, a good point. I remember it was a week ago we were at a uh, wealth symposium with a lot of fund managers there talking about the opportunities where they see in the market, as well as a lot of managed account investment committee members so those who run dealer groups and there was pretty much a consensus that no one was weighted towards john they didn't want to have they didn't see the opportunities there they saw too much risk and if we learn anything from the last 12 18 months of how you read the markets it's um when you're talking about an overcrowded trout or overcrowded <laughs> crowded trade and everybody's expecting the one thing from the market that's where you can have those great opportunities. Yeah, that... yeah. I think a fortnight, Chris, I was sort of saying the same thing. It was basically most analysts were saying China is, you know, un uninvestable, you know, basically, you know. We would never, we, you know, so everyone's saying don't invest. But that, that usually means that everyone's already out. Do you know what I mean? So everyone's already, when everyone's saying I can't invest in there, it means we've already taken our money out and we're, We've already sold out. So it just means everyone's out. So that's the thing about views in the market there. If you if you sort of if everyone's sort of saying the same thing, it's usually sort of you know it's just 
don't think about that's not where they're going to position in the future. It's sort of where they're positioned now. So it just means that everyone's already sold out in China, there, which is sort of that's the thing, you know, sort of there's not if, if everyone's already out and there's no one left to sell, what's going to happen? Well, we saw that before. Yeah. We've seen that market yeah. before the markets rally. And if everything goes up and everyone says there's no reason to be selling everything, it's a perfect, it's the, you know, nothing can go wrong. <laughs> it's like everyone's already long, everyone's bought. It's like there's no one left to buy. That's usually when your peak is. So you're getting definitely getting those signs here of a of a key low here. We, we saw it in the market too. We saw, you know, in, in early October there. Everyone was universally bearish. No one thought the market could get, go up and puts were through the roof and, you know, put the call cool parity was, you know, yeah, what's, what's the market done? It's been, it's been been rallying off those, you know, that lows there. So just think about, you know, that's usually, opinions are usually about um, how everyone's already positioned there. So, um, yeah, it's just interesting there. That's, um, so that can lead us into the portfolio management side because you've talked about markets and cycles and opportunity. The ASX is harder to call at the moment because of those conflicting cycles. But within that, your portfolio is doing well. You've selected some great shares. And this week you've put in the report ASX, which we have seen before. We can see inflated volume in the, the last couple of months and a sideways churn. So what's the read now on ASX? Yes, I think the last chart I posed up there it might have been a fortnight ago was the, just looking at the weekly charts. Basically, you can see when obviously we get a really aggressive sell down in ASX. And I think we've seen three over the last sort of three years. Um, but they've all ended up being V-shaped bottoms there. So it's sort of one of those stocks that really, once it comes out of a low, it can be, can be can bounce pretty aggressively. So um, that's the, you know, the positive aspect. Obviously, they can have deep sell downs, but then can have sort of deep bounces as well. So just it's interesting sort of looking at the weekly, but I just sort of drill into the daily here. We can definitely see the volume was elevated here over the last month. So those sort of show us accumulation, you know, got a little false break at the low there sort of late October, just on the chart. And then we've sort of got this little tight range here developing now. So I think a break out of that range would be positive in the short term. And considering this is one of those stocks that can turn around pretty sharply, yeah, it's pretty, you know, pretty interesting to me. So just just don't get a chance to buy this sort of stock. It's a bit like Macquarie and the banks. They sort of maybe only have one good sort of sell-off every year. So um, this one had one obviously during the middle of the year, but um, but yeah, it's just looks interesting here. So I think, you know, yeah, I think there's good risk reward there as well too, Chris. So that's a nice little tight channel there. Um, you know, if they're sort of buying there with a you know, couple of dollars sort of stop here. Um, and 60, maybe back to 80, you know, that's sort of, you know, we've probably got $12 of upside and maybe what, $2 of risk there. That's sort of six to one there. Some people think this might be able to go back up into the yeah, mid eighties or 90, but I think maybe going back to that range there around, you know, around 80, sort of 79, you know, 80 is probably a reasonable target there. So um, I like it there just because it's, you know, nice six to one risk reward there at least. Um, so yeah, it looks, it looks pretty interesting to me. Well, that's a good one for ASX. Computer share is one that we've discussed a fair few times over the last couple of weeks off air. We've talked about how it's a market leader. It's been making new highs as the market's been trawling at bottoms. It had a false break that didn't lead to a marginal new low. And that then turned into sort of VCP. So um, now that I've stolen all your thunder for computer yeah. share, what's catching your eye? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's you're absolutely 100% correct. I mean, that's, you know, we sort of, all the textbooks sort of tell us there that um, once once we go through a bit of a bear phase and bear market, we should be trying to look for the strongest stocks, you know, the stocks that have held up the best, stocks that are just sort of, you know, congesting underneath the high. Um, so this has done two things here. This this hasn't had a big correction. It's been, you know, and the whole thing's tightened up. Each sort of low has gotten shallower and shallower and shallower. And, you know, the volumes have been pretty robust there. You now, computer sheet does have you know some good reasons to um, to go high here too. You know, as a reasonable sort of growth plan there. Obviously, the you know um, moved to the U.S. markets there. So, um, you know, I think consensus earnings are sort of set to grow for you know the next couple of years there. So, this you know this this looks pretty bullish to me. This you know in terms of all the textbooks, in terms of what history tells us, this is in a strong position here. So. Um, if it cracks above that, um, you know, 
probably just above 26, 2650 there. Um, yeah, it could really pop here. And we're seeing once things pop through these ranges, they tend to sort of run. So this looks as strong. This looks as stock, you know, strong as any stock I can see on the board here, particularly in the top two, you know, in the ASX 200. There, probably no stock looking stronger than this. That's that's a good title to have. Um, one, if we go to the other side of the scale, you're looking at those that are trawling out a bit of a bottom, finding sort of support. You've got Home Consortium, which you've um, flagged uh, a bit recently as well. So what does this chart indicate to you with this little wedge that you've highlighted? Yeah, so this stock's had some pretty good growth, obviously, um, probably over the last four or five years there. It's look at, it probably got a bit ahead of itself there. I think, what, what, 850 there. It's sort of come off down to what, you know, almost to $4 there. So it's had a pretty decent decline there. So it's gone back more than 50% of the range. It's probably, you know, it's gone back more than 50% in price here. So um, that's a pretty large correction there for, you know, what, what's a, what, what's a pro, sort of property trust. So, um, yeah, so fairly decent decline there. Just the thing I was caught my eye there was that how corrective that decline was there, Chris. So had a bit of a bounce out of the last low, you know, you'd probably say we, we went up, you know, what, six or eight weeks into the into the sort of the high there. And since then, we've sort of come down in the same amount of time or at least more than that. So I think we're, what are we, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine weeks down, which is more time we haven't gone to a new low. So it's taken a long time here. So that's, that's kind of corrective. That's not impulsive. Like the last two sell downs, they were really impulsive moves really quick. Um, this thing's struggling to go down here. And then obviously last week, we just kicked up out of that range here. So... Just looks like it can sort of go back up to. So I sort of think that um, that low around six dollars there and twenty two, it should go up to up to there at least. That's probably the first resistance sort of zone to keep an eye on there. So I think there's a bit of upside move there. I just noticed quite a few of the other property trusts as well. I think GPT did something similar, broken out a bit of a range. There's just saw quite a few, and that's that's a good sign for the market because normally the property trusts are sort of market. You know, if the market's a bit negative and heading for a recession, or you you know, or the market's we go through a bear phase, that's usually a sector which no one wants to be in. So, you know, it's been a bit of damage in property trusts in the past and you know, people getting caught in there. So sort of it's, you know, been a few horror stories in that sector. So I think that's sort of one that people just tend to, um, if they feel like something's going bad there, they, they get out of those things. So um, so it's pretty bullish, I think, or pretty positive that they're actually breaking up. I know it's not much volume there, um, but it's, um, yeah, this thing is a good sign. They're actually sort of, they're popping up there. So um, yeah, I mean, Goodman GMG was sort of one that we had a couple of weeks ago, sort of popped up here. So just yeah, just a few of them are sort of showing the positivity there. So yeah, that looks looks pretty interesting to me. Yeah, I just saw it, like I just saw quite a few stocks actually just pop out of here. I mean, even you know Auckland airports. You know, I, I wasn't there wasn't sort of there wasn't a shortage of sort of breakouts this week. I was I was sort of I was sort of undenied. I I was putting charts in and out. Thing, oh, which one's better, this breakout or that breakout? You know, there's actually quite a lot of breakouts. Um, I know my playbook, I've done filled out a lot of springs in the last two weeks. There's just been so many that have bounced off those lows. Mm, and that's, yeah. that's probably what you're seeing, is it? Just yeah, and just breaking, yeah, breaking out of channels as well. So breaking out of these sort of, you know, downward channels, so sort of things are just sort of breaking out. So I was just, I could just sort of see things breaking out, you yeah. So, I mean, I know some things have had good, you know, it's, it's a real mixed market. There's actually some stocks that have had really good runs here. They're looking a little tired. Um, things like the financials have had pretty good moves, so that they look like a little bit wary here. Even the travel stocks have had a pretty nice move there, sort of getting a little, you know, hitting it, you know, some some levels just to be wary of. Um, but then other sectors are just starting to break out here. So, you know, maybe this is, this is like one, you know, probably normal to sort of see some things going up, some things going down, not just, not just sort of, um, you know, widespread, everything going up, everything going down type of thing. So, um, Well, on the yeah. um, property trust, you mentioned that there's sort of a few matters that um, we know that they were sold down heavily when the interest rates started hiking because just like you mentioned, Australians have been burnt with them before in the GFC. A lot of them had short-term debt and they had to refinance at higher rates or couldn't refinance. So that concern was flooding the Australian markets. And like what you're saying, with that rapid sell-off from sort of April through June, those REITs got hammered because the risk of uh, the refinancing and not being able to get good commercial rates. What we've seen in the last couple of weeks 
is some of the better quality ones have been able to announce they have secured longer term financing, sort of five, six years, as opposed to the one and two the markets are concerned about at more favourable rates than one or two uh, term notes are going at the moment. So five and six years tying that up and saying to investors, we're not exposed to this massive hike right now, we've secured it. And then the other one is obviously the leases and the whales, which is um, me a concern. But if the investors feel like sifting through the reports and seeing the secured uh, leases and the quality of the tenants, uh, we had noticed that divergence within that group that the leading property trusts that are doing pops, a bit like what you've got here on the chart, have normally announced something like securing finance or good secure tenants or a combination of both. So uh, are they the kind of things that you'd look for in a property trust, um, those kind of reports? Uh, I look a little bit there. I mean, I think the ones that I've been looking at have all been pretty pretty high occupancy. So I've been, you know, been really high. So actually quite maybe higher than expected. So, But also looking at the quality names as well. So um but yeah, just just interesting that that sort of sector looks pretty. It's not a sector I normally sort of have. Um, I have a lot of sort of um, heavily weighting into. Probably probably you know probably more lighter weighting. So, but, um, but yeah, it's, it's just, normally a slower moving yeah. one, isn't it? When you've got yeah, better yeah. trades, it's yeah, it can be for sure. You're getting four yeah. percent from a rate, or yeah. fourteen yeah. or twenty four percent from. Yeah, well, I'm probably more interested in, in that. You know, this I think Auckland well, 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 International is probably more of a safer sort of trader, but this has probably got a bit more. Slightly sexier there, just because of all those other, um, all the other infrastructure assets have been bid for, been taken over. So it does sort of feel like, you know, Auckland Airport's got that, you know, if you're going to buy sort of something a little bit safe, a bit boring, it's a little bit like something like the ASX has got a bit of an edge there because we know that maybe London Stock Exchange or another exchange might come and bid on it. It's always been in the background. And the same with Auckland Airports as well. That sort of, you know, a lot of those infrastructure assets have all been bid for by private equity groups. So you know that there's there's always a chance. I mean, it should you shouldn't be sort of, you know, putting a, you know, resting on that. You should trade it what it is. But that does give you a little bit of an edge as well if there's that that sort of setup's potentially there. Um, but yeah, you know, that that's another one that's sort of broken out of that range. There, there's some reasonable volume sort of there. It's just it's a quality, you know. Yeah, I just sort of. Quite a few fund managers I respect there actually, um, you know, um, yeah, sort, sort of do do like that. So I think it looks pretty good. So, yeah. Okay, well, that's Auckland Airport. You've also got APM, so Human Services, which has been a good movement uh, in this group. Well, in this group, you've got sort of this apex or this coming down like a... Yeah, it's a relatively a new sort of uh, listing here. Um, yeah, it's a... Yeah, it's a, it's a Reasonable size group there, um, but yeah. So I, I, yeah, I actually don't mind that. So I think it's just uh, it's really you can, it's just it's it's showing some relative strength there, um, and yeah, I think if it sort of breaks above that little swing high there, I think this is the one that can kick on. This it's forecasting pretty strong growth this year and and reasonable growth next year. So it's just sort of one of that new sort of companies which could could pop out of that range. And I think if it breaks out of that range there. So again, it's that sort of chart there where it's all sort of been consolidating just underneath the high, a relatively new company as well. So it's just sort of one to keep an eye on there. I think, you know, I know there's a few issues around NDIS and stuff there, but um, but yeah, I do. That that does look pretty, pretty decent. So, um, yeah. Well, yeah. well um, if you look at another one, you've got Downer. So it's a similar thing here. You've got some sort of channel lines. You're looking to bounce off one of them and possibly head up to or through the overhead one. Uh, just like the volume down here, Chris, the volume off that low is pretty robust. It's basically accelerated. You know, it's been some big accumulation taking place there. And you can see this is this whole, it's, it's a reasonable correction there. That's taken a long time to get down here from that October high there. It's almost, it's almost a year going down, but it hasn't really gone that far down here. It's, the whole thing's overlapping. Again, it's this sort of corrective decline. So again, you're sort of hanging around here. You're not really having a big deep pullback. And we've definitely seen the volume come in here. So that... That's sort of, you know, again, our quality industrials uh, like this segment, obviously, you know, do all your construction repairs. And um, so it's just pretty diverse sort of group here. So, um, yeah, do, do like that. So um, probably just get a drill into the daily now and sort of try and find a safe entry. But I, I think that looks pretty interesting as well. So just 
just sort of meets our criteria, sort of stocks we're looking at. Um, maybe a little bit boring here, but boring's good here. I think it's showing some relative strength here by holding up here. So I think that looks looks pretty positive. Nice. Well, we can jump into questions of the week from here. And one of them, the easiest one, I think, to answer is uh, people that ask how they get access to this report. So contact details are on screen. And, yeah, if they uh, want to, if they want to email me, Chris, that's fine. Just if they email through, yeah. then I'll, I can put them on a little trial for a bit. Um, yeah, I'll pr probably just put them on for a short period of time, and if, if they're interested in any more, then they can contact me. Right. But if they email me, I can I can add them through there. Email is the best way, because obviously you've got their email yeah. address and where to send it. Yeah. You know, we asked on Friday if there were other questions uh, that people wanted to, some listeners wanted to put forward and ask us. Uh, so we did have some, and one of them was about the Williams percentage, which is sometimes on your charts. So what is this Williams percentage? It's yeah, just an indicator that I do use from time to time. It's, it's actually really good for weekly charts. Um, the Williams percentage R is not, um, it's not good at everything. It's actually, it's actually not good at most things. It's only good at one thing from, from my experience. It's actually good at really identifying the deep lows. So when, when you sort of see that really oversold condition in markets and they sort of go down to the deep low, so it just picks up really, you know, on a weekly sort of, I've noticed with the stocks in particular, it'll pick up the sort of, if they get into the oversold zone there, um, just picks them up quite nicely sort of. Um, yeah, so it's just a good indicator. It's not, not good on get daily charts, definitely not good for picking in highs because you'll, you'll, you'll sit oversold all the time. But if it's, um, if it's sort of, sorry, not, it's not good for overbought, I mean, I should say, but, um, but on the weekly charts, it really does give you the sort of deep lows on the weekly there. So we sort of see them go down to, you know, you know cross below the 80 mark and then, then they come back above there. Um, those, those often sort of mark some, you know, pretty decent lows there. Just sort of telling you the market's in that sort of, I've a sold zone, and then you can start drilling into the dailies and looking for fine, fine. Um, fine tuning your timing. Yeah, you know, exactly. Like, like we're doing with the ASX there. So the, the ASX would be basically like the, the Williams percent R, we'd, we'd be showing that oversold here right now in the weekly chart. So we're drilling into our daily now to try and find a, a safe entry. So it's a good tool in that regard. Okay. So that's one tool for using the large picture weekly coming down to daily. The next question that we had come through was about liquidity and capital protection. So when on the Friday report, we went through some thinly traded companies, liquidity was pretty low. How do you end up trading those low liquidity companies, Gary? Yeah, so it's, it's not a case of me not trading them because they're probably not very liquid. It probably just comes down to more um, the size there. So it just means for me, I might, you know, like one of the rules for me personally is that um, I might start with a like a you know seven to ten percent position sizing if, if I like the stock and then I'll sort of build on that. So with something like you know like an ASX for argument's sake, I might do a eight or ten percent holding and then I might you know I might potentially take up to twenty percent of my portfolio if I really have high conviction and I really like it. Whereas something which is a bit smaller, um, I'll probably only start with maybe five or six percent and. I probably would would only ever do half the size. So something that's less liquid, I'm going to be a lot smaller in size there. Um, so yeah, just generally sort of probably probably would be big half of something that's more liquid. So if it's you know good quality stock and liquid, then I feel like I can get up to that sort of scale up in size. I will. If it's sort of small, um, yeah. I mean potentially we get into something small that starts to move. Once you sort of maybe get into profit there, you might be able to add to it a little bit. And then, but you know, you just, it's hard that the smaller ones are sort of, you're often taking a more risk there because they're more, more liquid. So you, you just need to trade smaller there. So, but yeah, generally, I, I, I probably would just have a smaller size there, would, you know, is probably the short answer. Okay, that's a good way of addressing that. Thank you. If viewers and listeners have some questions they want to put forward, they can just leave them in the comments below and we can try and get to them uh, either on Friday or next week. From that point, we'll wrap for the week and say thank you very much, Gary Glover from Novus Capital. Thanks, Chris. Now, Gary mentioned some of the trading strategies, uh, volatility contraction pattern and those kind of compressions. We go into those in a bit more detail on the playlist on the right. And then also some of those illiquid companies that he's just mentioned. We did discuss those on Friday and that playlist is also on the right and the left-hand side are the Twitter, Twitter handles as well.